joining session B here. Um, we're going to be talking all about indigenous foods this morning. Um, I'm Heidi Rader. I'm with the University of Alaska Cooperative Extension Service and primarily serving tribes here in interior Alaska. Um, this morning, please welcome Latasha Redhouse as our first speaker. She's going to be talking all about uh, the American Indian Foods Program. So it's 10.15 and we'll go ahead and get started. Great, good morning everyone. Um, my name is Latasha Redhouse. Um, I did want to um, give time before I jump into the presentation for my colleague Tommy to introduce herself. Um, real quick, I'm the American Indian Foods Program Director with the Intertribal Agriculture Council, and we're really happy to share a little bit about that program, but also the programming that um, Tommy oversees. So I'll just go ahead and let Tommy um, introduce herself. Um, hi, my name is Tommy Peterson. Um, I work for Intertribal Agriculture Council as a regenerative economy specialist. Um, I'll let Latasha start off on the presentation and then I'll take over right at the end. Great. Um, let me go ahead and share my screen or let's see here. It's been a minute since I had to share my screen <laughs> or share a presentation all of a sudden I'm kind of um if you go to view, view probably slideshow oh there we go it's a little screen. tricky if you only have one screen though yeah <laughs> Here you <Great>. go. <laughs> awesome thank you so much um it's I'm working on my second cup of coffee so hopefully mid presentation, I'll be a little uh, awake, but <laughs> um, so the American Indian Foods Program is um, one of many components of the Intertribal Agriculture Council. Um, we're, the program itself is um, dedicated to providing um, education, resources, and other types of support material to assist um, our on the ground producers that are trying to build um, uh, you know, market access for their product. Um, so we focus on export program, our international, our, which is our international programming. We have the Native Food Connection, which is our dom domestic programming. Um, we also introduced the Regen Nation Seal and Pledge in 2021. Um, and then we have our Made Produced by American Indian Trademark, or oftentimes referred to as the IAC Trademark. Um, so we received funding through a partnership with the Foreign Ag Service um, Market Access Program. Um, this funding allows us to really build our export programming um, so that our producers, our members of our, of our programming can um, showcase their product all across the world. Um, our, our services include meeting coordination or trademark coordinating um, with qualified buyers, um, we provide interpreter assistance, um, just general trade show support. Uh, we also conduct um, reverse trade missions where we bring buyers from uh, different markets to the US and provide different tours of, of pr producers uh, facilities. Um, the other cool thing about this is that if you are a, an American Indian Foods Program member, um, we provide um, kind of a match service. So if you wanted to participate in a trade show in Canada or um, Barcelona, or you just wanted to do some market research, we provide um, reimbursement up to 100% for native producers within our program. So we cover lodging, per diem, airfare, um, and sometimes whether it's samples needing to be shipped to a buyer, we can cover those costs. So it really helps Again, 
with our producers that are emerging or small to medium size um, really helps um, kind of mitigate that overhead cost that sometimes can be overwhelming for smaller companies. Um, we just wrapped up a few shows earlier this year, we attended Gulf Food in Dubai. Um, we also participated in trade show mission with uh, Middle Eastern buyers. And the interest um, in that market is overwhelming. Um, we had buyers wanting to, wanting more information about maple syrup, um, kombucha, uh, the fry bread mix. So it was a really, really great way for us to expose consumers around the world um, about like the different products that are being made and produced by American Indian. Um, we also just wrapped up a show in Anaheim, California. It was a natural products expo show. And that shows where we can really elevate the Regen Nation seal, but also a lot of their producers um, maintain traditional ecological knowledge when, um, when growing their product. And so um, it was a great way for us to highlight these various methods um, in these settings uh, to really elevate um, Indian agriculture. Right. So the Native Food Connection um, really was a response to the pandemic. Um, in 2020, we realized that a lot of the, uh, again, businesses were closing down. Um, we couldn't travel anywhere outside of the US. Um, and a lot of our producers were trying to pivot from export um, activities or, or researching export markets. They really needed to figure out a way to feed their community, but also get food to their regional or local markets. So the Native Food Connection, again, really is a way we can focus on domestic growth. Um, we just hired on a domestic market specialist. His name is Donovan Sather. He's also a former um, AIF member when he was the CEO of Red Lake Nation Foods. Um, and he's leading this program. Um, and we're really excited to have him on board because there is a huge interest in um, companies that have expressed the need to figure out ways to grow in, in the domestic market. Um, through this, we, we also developed the, the food boxes um, where we were able to, to purchase and source different ingredients and fill these food boxes and send them uh, to like the Fidipper centers in Montana. Or we um, were able to work with some Northwest nonprofits to get some traditional foods, um, again, that were sourced from Native companies into Native communities. It, it's been a really, really great um, time and really kind of advocated the need for, or kind of vocalized the need of, of um, um, buying native and, and, and feeding our native communities. Um, major activities include market access for native products and services. We just launched a native market success workshop, <clears throat> sorry, that guides companies um, through the ag marketing or the, the USDA vendor application. <clears throat> we also provide um, organize, organization and sponsored conferences. So we work closely with native, native American owned organizations or retailers to really create this partnership um, where they can source products for their use. Um, and then, supporting more effective branding and trademark of products and producer marketing education. Um, we definitely love to highlight the producer's story um, and tell the story from per the perspective of the producer or the company stories. Because the cool thing about Native American country or Indian country is that not all stories are the same. Um, we have so many different um, um, beginning stories uh, with different tribes. So it's, it's a really, really unique way to, to again, share our story through Native Food Connection. Um, I mentioned earlier that the Regen Nation Seal and Pledge was um, launched in 2021 on Earth Day. It was a way that we can reclaim um, the regenerative and sustainable kind of verbiage that has been used um, uh, all across agriculture. Um, and it is a way that we can um, complement the Made and Produced by American Indian certification trademark, which I'll be talking about here shortly. Um, and we really didn't want to 
we're working on kind of standards right now, but we really wanted to um, use the regeneration seal to highlight the producers that are utilizing traditional ecological knowledge um, or uh, sustainable harvesters for our fishers. Um, but we, we have this pledge um, and it's listed out here on this presentation, which is work in tandem with my animals, land, water, crops to develop a mutually beneficial relationship with them in tune with the environment and self. Um, have a genuine connection with the ecosystem and the citizens for my tribal, local, and global community that promotes its greater well being. Um, promote the renewal of ancient native led wisdom in my agricultural endeavors that returns us to the type of practices that have been regenerative in nature for generations to come. So it's a really great, great way that our natural resources or even just our um, regenerative um, uh, group um, can really encourage and uplift the work that our producers are doing to um, be the, the land steward that they are. Um, so I'll be covering the Made and Produced by American Indian Trademark. It was um, formed in 1993 and has grown in prominence and helps consumers easily identify authentic American Indian produced goods. Um, so the, the Made and Produced by American Indian Trademark is how all of our program is structured. So producers apply to use the trademark. Once they are approved, they're automatically um, approved for American Indian Foods Programming. Um, and then we provide, again, all of the marketing, business development type of resources and support. Um, but I love this, this timeline. Um, you know, we, we were um, out there way before all of the other um, certification process. <clears throat> and so, um, again, we, we have been here for, the, the trademark has been here for quite some time and has really grown um, domestically and uh, internationally among consumers. The Man and Produced by American Indian trademark is a certification trademark that authenticates that the product um, is truly made and produced by American Indian. Um, the vetting process is very, um, we authorize the use. Um, so once you apply, we vet and just make, ensure that this producer or company is indeed um, owned by a tribal member or a tribal um, tribal, tribal business, or it is a tribal business. Um, through this universal emblem, consumers are able to easily identify authentic American Indian produced goods. Um, our producers are companies that are um, approved users of the trademark can apply directly to their packaging or to their product. Um, one of our companies or a couple of our companies have applied the product directly to their um, their pack, their packaging like our kombucha, or they just use it in when they um, set up their retail space. So I'll let Tommy go ahead and share. Thank you. Um, so the Intertribal Agriculture Council promotes regenerative economies and highlights the benefits of investing in Indian agriculture by providing individual assistance on business and financial solutions that promote healthy and sustainable economic growth throughout Indian country. So we have this great technical assistance network. We have this amazing market access um, program, um, but we've realized that a lot of times our producers are needing even more in-depth detail on how to um, get in the market. And one of the biggest uh, obstacles is usually access to capital. So that is where I'm hoping this program can come in. And we, first off, we're trying to encourage lending and credit institutions to provide innovative financial solutions that kind of work with agriculture. And we're really um, putting an emphasis on funding operations that are transitioning into regenerative agriculture or supporting those type of our, um, operations that have already been regenerative, your original land stewards, providing them the capital to be able to continue what they do. Um, we've been able to see a lot of success in that. One of the greatest success stories would be uh, the native CDFI network. Um, the community development financial institutions are able to provide credit in various ways. Um, the one that was just developed in 2019 that's called Occupton is a native um, CDFI that is just for agriculture. And they're able to do lending in a different way that is sometimes, it looks more like they're investing in the producer. They're able to give them the opportunity to provide equity growth. 
I'm able to do a little different things in our operation, like changing over to regenerative agriculture. Um, so that is one of the biggest things that our um, programming with regenerative economies is focusing on. But also we're focusing on business management. So you want to provide business and financial literacy tools to help an operation to grow, but while also protecting um, the natural resources that we have left in Indian country. Um, and then the second or the last part is market development. So I want to help with being able to provide economic research and market analysis on a domestic and international scale so that there is different pathways and opportunities for producers to take on all the different levels. I do believe there is opportunity out there to, for producers to do things differently. Competitiveness is great for markets. And I do think we can provide some different pathways, both locally, regionally, and of course on the global scale. Um, so that is regenerative economies in a nutshell. Thanks, Tommy. Um, let me see. Oh, shoot. Okay, skim over one more. Um, okay, cool. So I'll just leave it on this slide. Um, but the overall premise of American Indian Foods, again, is to, to support um, our producers enter whatever market they're interested in pursuing. Um, we just want to highlight the endless possibilities and the creative value that food entrepreneurs add to the tribal, local, and regional economy. And so, you know, we if, if you are a tribal producer um, that is sitting on this call or a fisher and you're wanting to be more active in, in growing your local either food sovereignty or your access to, to foods or healthier traditional foods within your community, we'd love to learn about those efforts. Um, I know a lot of people are a little, or sometimes companies are a little hesitant to um, submit an application because then they think that they're gonna have to go to Barcelona for a trade show. Um, actually, it's just a great way that we can focus on these different levels of, um, uh, resiliency through ag achievements. So um, if you do have any questions, feel free to reach out to myself, um, the AF domestic marketing specialist, Donna Vince there or um, Tommy Peterson. And we should be adding another personnel here shortly who will cover a couple of our international markets. Thank you so much, Latasha and Tommy. Do you guys, um, are there any questions before we move on to our next presenters? Okay, there's some contact info in there. Let's see. Um, great, well, thank you so much. It's all such an important program. Um, and we're going to hear next from Dan Cornelius, who is also with the Indian Agriculture Council. Um, so Dan, feel free to share your screen and turn your video on. Thank you. Good afternoon, or I guess uh, good morning for, uh, for Alaska. Just give me one sec, let me pull up my... PowerPoint. Do you want me to go ahead and um, and get started, or were we going to wait till um, till fifteen to the hour? A good question. I would say just go ahead and get started. Um, yeah, we're five minutes out, so I think we're okay. good to go, and maybe we'll have a few extra minutes for questions. Great. So. Uh, I'm sorry, I wasn't on the last session. I'm, I'm. My understanding then is then you probably would have had some background on the Intertribal Ag Council. Most folks on have already, already familiar with it from we had, Latasha. We had Latasha and Tommy uh, talk about the American Indian Food Program. Great. Well, I um, I also work for the Intertribal Agriculture Council. I'm a member of uh, the Oneida Nation of Wisconsin, and I work in the Great Lakes region. And what I'm going to talk today about is um, some efforts that we've had to build regional su supply chains to to promote regenerative agriculture. And I'll just kind of start off with um, 
going back really almost 10 years, we have work, been working to support, to support domestic marketing efforts. Um, I know with Latashi and Tommy, there's been more of a focus in the past uh, two, three years of looking at how do we support our domestic producers. But um, you know, over the years, Inter the Intertribal Ag Council has really been more focused on export markets. And you know, to get people to that point, it, it's it's a lot to, it's a lot to put a it's a lot to put a um, just a retail product together to be able to do it at a scale where you can export to another country is uh, is really challenging. I'm sorry, just one second. My apologies. I have my my four year old coworker is um, had a couple of questions, but um, so we we started back in um, in 2013, a mobile farmers market. You can see the van here, and uh, to try to provide more support to um, to to our smaller producers and to build the, really the the regional connections as well as national as well to support reconnecting trade routes to support value added products. And you can see here just a glimpse of, um, of some of those products. This was back from 2000, uh, from 2017 and wasn't even all the products that are out there then. And definitely we have, uh, we've got a lot more now, but just some of that diversity of, of what we have, it's, it's really, um, it's incredible to, to see and just all of the different flavors and the tastes across the country is, I think, is one of the one of the the great assets that we that we have with our foods. So, looking at a, at the bigger picture of of asking, what is the tribal ag and and food economy? Um, and these numbers, I know of of um, I'm sorry, I probably uh, should have updated the the slide for more of an Alaskan um, uh, image, but um, we have over, well, at this point, over 80,000 Native American farmers, ranchers. We have a, a good number of fishers as well. You know, for those ag sales, we're at three and a half billion dollars. And um, you know, looking at what else is, what is our tribal food economy? $150 million roughly per year. It's, it's been a little bit more lately is going into the food distribution program and Indian reservations. And then we've got our retails, our groceries, we've got gaming and, and food service. So when we really look just within our within our tribal, our own tribal food economy, it's substantial. And, and just to quantify, of to look at trying to quantify what what is our our gaming, our food service within our gaming operations. Um, I haven't been able to find that exact number, but I have been able to find that the National Indian Gaming Association that uh, NIGA puts out numbers annually. And prior to the pandemic, um, those numbers were about $33.7 billion per year of our total overall revenue for our gaming operations. And um, while they don't publish food service data, I did look at the uh, UNLV Center for Gaming Studies in, the, in the, the Nevada State Gaming Commission, they did a study for the for the Nevada casinos, and they found that those casinos, roughly 22% of their revenue was food service. So, um, you know, we, we calculate that out at 33.7. That's almost seven and a half billion dollars a year. And even if we want to be conservative and say, you know, even at 11% of total revenue, from a gaming operations being food service, that still is three and a half billion dollars a year, which is the same amount as our total as our total ag sales. So you know, just looking at at what does this mean? If we could capture just ten percent more of that of that three and a half billion dollars, ten percent of that that's three hundred fifty million dollars a year that could be cycling through our tribal economies. And, um, you know, so I, I do have the question on here of um, what locally produced foods are available in your community. There may be some livestock uh, 
in in Alaska, but I know that it's going to be more of a fish and the mariculture of, um, you know, it's going to be a lot of, um, of, you know, whether uh, shellfish, even some kelp, but then, you know, the reindeer. And, and so you know, I think it's important to really look at regionally what are, you know, what are our, our foods and what, and what is available and how can we do more to build our regional economies to be able to support our producers while keeping more of that food local. That, those are some of the questions that, um, that you know, really want people to be thinking about. And I'm gonna be sharing, I think, some exciting pilot projects that we've done that I hope may provide um, you know, at least some food for thought for what may work in Alaska. I also know in Alaska that um, transportation is, is a lot more difficult, a lot more expensive. And so I think it even, even more so speaks to how do you build up as much local production as um, and regional production as, as possible. So um, this, this is just the Rocky Mountain region and why I'm showing Rocky Mountain region is just as, a, as an example for, you know, this is uh, similar across in the lower 48 that a lot of our native lands are, are, con are controlled by non-natives. And, um, and, and it correlates out with then the sales off of, off of our lands. This is just one region. You can see four fifths of on reservation sales from the Rocky Mountain region are coming from, uh, from non-native producers. And I'm sorry, if you just give me just, just, sorry about that. Um, and but you know I, I would encourage to think for Alaska too to think just with the with the fisheries. I know I've spent some time at Prince of Wales Island, and we're out fishing, um, and uh, you know and, and I know that that a lot of the non natives in the area will um, and will say that uh, that that fish is uh, you know that all the fish are being caught by the the tribal fishermen and that's why there's no fish. At the same time as we have boat after boat after boat of the charters going out and then the major commercial trawlers out there as well. So, um, you know, I and that was just some some perspective there. Of, you know, I was out just helping of um, of catching fish for community and we were we were smoking it. But, you know, I I think that it's important just to think about within our food system is, you know, where where are those dollars going and how can we bring more control locally and keep the dollars local. Uh, so average government payment, um, these are 2012 numbers. These are av average government payment to, um, to agricultural producers. And you can just see that disparity there. I don't have a black farmers on here. Black farmers are even lower than native farmers for 2012. For 2017, USDA does an ag census every five years. Um, it's happening this year. Um, the 2017 numbers, the overall numbers were up. Native, uh, native producers were a little bit closer in line, still a bit below. And black farmers still only about half of, of that national average. So just looking at um, what resources currently are available of support resources um, for, for local foods, for regional foods, for building up um, really the the ability to be able to um, to take a, a local product, process it, and keep it within a community. We have a lot of programs open right at this very moment. Um, within uh, the USDA's Agricultural Marketing Service, there is the Local Food Purchase Assistance Program. And this is, this is a big one that I really encourage everybody to think about. There's $410 million dollars that USDA is putting out for local food purchases over the next, uh, th these will be two year agreements. These are available to, to state and tribal governments can, can apply. So 400, 410 million total, and then that's divided among the states. If there's tribes within a state, then USDA is reserving 40% of those funds for, for tribal governments. Another big one, value at a producer grant. We just did a webinar earlier this week with rural development that's available on 
IAC's YouTube channel. Um, and then the, the meat and poultry processing expansion program. Um, and, and then the two, the two, I guess the three uh, programs that are kind of lumped together under uh, what's called a, a LAMP um, programs are the local and farmers market promotion programs and the regional food system partnership grant. Each of those have additional money put in, in their pools this year from um, from the American Rescue Plan. So it would be a good year to look at, at applying. And then I just have a list of some additional resources as well. I'm not gonna cover all of them, but I'm happy at any point to, uh, to talk in greater detail if people have questions. And then I know um, that uh, Tikhan Galbraith is our, is our technical assistant specialist for Alaska. Tikhan's gonna have pretty good knowledge on most of these programs as well. So now, now moving to, to really the, the main um, topic I want to talk about is a, is a couple of the pilot food distribution projects that, um, that we've been working on. And one of them is a, is a tribal elder food box. But just to go back to two years from today of where was our world, well, where was our country at? It was the, the pandemic, the lockdowns were, were rolling across the country. Um, I know going into a lot of, um, of stores, uh, granted, this was the toilet paper aisle, but um, the, the shelves were empty. And food security, I think, really took on a heightened interest and people were, were, were panicked and were thinking of, well, if I don't have access to be able to go buy food, then I better stock up right now. People were panic buying at the same time as we had, um, you know, animals weren't able to, the processing plants were closing down. Uh, there wasn't the, the, the capacity to be able to, uh, to process animals. And um, it was, it was an incredibly disruptive time. So to, to go back that two years, you know, just to think about where have we come from over these past two years and what insights can we, can we really gain? And what opportunities may be available? Um, Intertribal Ag Council had done, um, had done a survey in spring into early summer of 2020. And, and uh, we surveyed producers, tribal leaders, and, and distribution programs to be outlets. And just to look at what were, what were the biggest concerns, what, what resources were desired, the finance and the funding, the marketing support were all key. When we looked at, um, We've looked at the USDA data, the, the Ag Census, only 6% of our native producers are, are engaged in direct to consumer sales. So 90% are relying on, on external markets, mostly commodity production. But... I think we lost Dan there. Um, it's like... It's like Dan is, is gone. So hopefully we'll, we'll give him a couple minutes to jump back on. Um, and for those of you who may have joined, we're a little bit of a head of schedule. Um, and so we're about halfway into Dan's presentation on navigating the USDA to maximize opportunities for, tri for tribes. And he is with the Indian Agriculture Council um, he was just talking about some of the great programs that are available now, and I see Tikhan is on. Um, Tikhan Galbraith, he is Alaska's technical assistant here for the Indian Agriculture Council. Hopefully I got your title right. Um, thanks, Glenna. Good, good idea. In the meantime, everyone share your favorite wild or local food in the chat. Oh, we got Dan back. Hi, Dan. I am really sorry. Um, so I just was going to be talking about some of the challenges that our producers face and the internet access was going to be one of them. On cue, my, um, my, <laughs> my internet went out. I am uh, trying to join through a hotspot on my phone right now. So I'm going to stop my screen. 
screen share. Hopefully that'll help a little bit. With okay, you're still breaking up. Like, you're still breaking um, up a bit. Um, but yeah, if you just want to do the no video, no screen share, maybe that'll help. Slides are. Can you can you hear me okay right now? Not great, but I we could hear you a little bit. Oh, can can you can you hear me? Can you hear me better without a screen share? Oh, I can hear I'm you. Sorry, can you hear me any better now? A little bit delayed. <laughs> um, okay. we understand um, about poor internet here in Alaska. That's for sure. So. Yeah, you know, it's we have a storm that is that's coming in right now and um so i think both for my my phone and then my internet is uh um i don't know it's just all of a sudden it's just totally cut out can you hear me though all right um it's okay and i i could also get you the phone number megan i'll, I'll look that up and i'm did you share your presentation with us ahead of time I don't, I, I don't think so, but I, um, I've got a PDF of it. Okay, you're, so, you're sounding better now. And if you wanted to email that to me, I can put that in the, the chat here. Um, yeah, I, I can. Um, I, I will email it to you. you can see if you could phone call in for the last 15 minutes would be another option the snow is is coming in i think I, i'm just going to talk through then the rest of my presentation i'm really sorry because um so i'm just I, it, with how slow this is going it's probably going to be difficult to um um so i'm just going to patient to you and maybe we can just pick up from um I'm sorry about uh the timing on this that my internet is, has not had problems for at least a couple of weeks if not a couple months thanks for your patience everyone um Having some technical difficulties, which I'm sure can we you, all under hear me. Can you hear me yeah. any better now? Yeah, yeah, you're coming in great now. I'm back on. I'm back on my internet. I it, it just entirely cut out though, so I don't know. Um, I see. Are people? You're, we're on a short bathroom break. Oh, um, let's see. I think we still have most people here. So, I just I just sent that text moments before you jumped on. So go ahead. We've got about All right. I'm just going to try minutes. to keep going. I'm going to try to just go fairly quick through my slides just um, in case it cuts out again. Um, so overall, you know, the feedback we got from um, from the survey is really a focus on shortening the supply chains and emphasis on direct marketing. And then, you know, really looking with the pandemic of our, um, you know, at that time, um, from the empty store shelves to at least down here, we had semi trucks of, of milk and dairy coming in with the USDA food box program. And I think that there's an appreciation for, for that food. But when we've got, when we're giving out gallons of milk to our elders, you know, it really just had to ask the question of, you know, if we could put our own program together, what would it look like? And so that led to, um, you know, to, to discussions. And for us, this one of my friends, Greg Johnson, had, um, had developed this Ojibwe seasonal harvest calendar. And, you know, just asking, that, starting with the question of, well, what is our food system? What foods do we want if, if we could really... Um, decide or our, and our elders could decide what would they want what would those foods be so that was our that was our starting point uh, with developing this pilot program of the tribal elder food box and some background on it um, we had got a grant of 428,000 from feeding america and it supported 900 boxes every other week for a total of almost 11,000 boxes 86 percent of that funding went directly to food purchases. The average uh, box at um, just under $41 per box. Um, I, I will also mention 
that 41% of those food purchases were from tribal producers. And you can see here of these were our tribes that received boxes and uh, our indigenous producers, our other local producers, and then the, the partners that we had working on it. We started with three tribes and we, we expanded um, actually to eight tribes by the end of the first year. And we are continuing this effort this, this year. We have, um, we've got over three times the amount of funding this year as we did last. So are excited to be expanding it to more tribes. And just to give a, a bit more background on how this worked, we had a partner of a, a Wisconsin Food Hub Cooperative that had a cold storage warehouse. And so items would, would be shipped there, packed into boxes. Um, we kept the frozen items separate till they got to, to the distribution locations. Um, but you can see here of Red Cliff Whitefish Fillets. I'd worked with Red Cliff uh, for almost 10 years of, um, of working with them on discussion of, of developing a fish processing operation. And then it ended up opening in October of 2020. So the timing was good that they were able to, to get the product in and the prices that their fishermen are getting for, for, that, for that wholesale fish have increased um, substantially. So to see it going in, those are, that's one of those items. Um, another one of our of our partners, Ziva Majowing Farm, is uh, is at Little Travers in uh, in Michigan, and um, historically they were the traders. They're right at the at the uh, Straits of Mackinac, where um, where Lake Michigan and Lake Huron meet. They've got a vegetable farm there. They also have a market, and we were able to buy uh, carrots and potatoes. Their farm manager he told me that that one sale when I, I drove our van over to pick it up, that one sale would have taken them a month of doing farmer's markets three, uh, three days a week for an entire month to be able to reach the, that same amount of sales. And knowing that the food was going to, to, eld, to tribal elders, it just made it that much better. We were able then to, to get them boxes as well for, uh, for their elders. Um, another one of our participating tribal producers, Forest County Potawatomi, they provided all of the aquaponic lettuce for, um, for, for the effort. And you can see an aerial there of, of, of their farm with the corn maze. I was dropping off wild rice to, the, to them when I was coming back with all of um, those carrots and, and potatoes. You know, the feedback that they gave to scale up to do 900, 900 units, and they would do a little bit, a little bit extra, they said that those first couple, you know, the first one in particular, but about the first three harvests to be able to scale up to that point, it was a challenge, but it really helped them to dial in their operation because they, they've had the farm for almost five years, but they just got this aquaponics operation going in the past year. So it was great for them to have the income coming in, but also that experience to be able to scale up. Um, as I mentioned already, the Red Cliff Fish Company opened in 2020, uh, we worked with them of, of providing assistance on obtaining one of those USDA value added producer grants in 2015. And then um, it provided some assistance on that value added producer grant. And ultimately the feasibility study that was done with it went to um, you know, putting the, the plan together for this fish processing operation. And, and help them to secure the capital and additional funds, and a lot of grant funds to be able to, to get this, this fish market and, um, and fish processing operation up and going. I'll just also make a note of, um, of the, this is herring here. And that herring, that Lake Superior herring, personally, I think it's one of the most delicious um, fishes. You know, it's one of my favorites. It's, it's been almost kind of a waste fish over the years that it's harvested largely for, for the eggs. But when they opened, all of that publicity that they were getting, the customers started becoming aware of the herring and, um, you know, and the overall market interest in that herring has increased now. So it was kind of cool. It's just that larger impact that, that, that their presence has, has had. Now, our biggest limitation 
with the first year of that program of the elder food box is it was limited to perishable items. We wanted the flexibility to include some wild rice, some maple syrup. So we uh, hosted a fundraising dinner at my farm and we're able to raise enough money off of that to be able to provide wild rice. And then one of our partners, uh, the Oneida Food Pantry had a grant that was able to purchase syrup. So we were able to to look at, at some ways to raise some more money and funds to get um, to get more product into that into the program. Uh, here you see some of the wild rice from Bruce Savage at Spirit Lake Native Farms, and um, really grateful that Bruce was able to help to to source that that hand harvested rice. Um, so uh, a, just a few more slides here of the recipient feedback was was critical and. Going back to a lot of where these efforts started was, you know, all that milk and dairy coming in, but really looking at how do we build food security while supporting our producers. Um, we tried throughout the, the process of the with the first year to put together boxes that we knew that the elders were, were going to appreciate and use those foods. We did a survey as well, and you can see here just some of um, you know of the highlights of the favorite items, and then what they what they requested more of, and working on you know on, on incorporating more of those requests for this next year. Um, and you can see here we've um, we've got at this point a um, million dollars secured. We should have the three hundred thousand from Feeding America. Looking to expand from last year, nine hundred. We're looking at fourteen to eighteen hundred boxes every other week, and a total of sixteen distributions from May to December, and sourcing you know again as much as we can from tribal producers. I've got the slide here again of some of the additional USDA support resources. Um, not going to go into a lot of detail, but again, happy to discuss any of those. And um, with that, I'm just open it up if there if there are questions. You know, a lot of the intention here too is I, I did want to in particular share that that LFPA, that local food purchase um, assistance program that's open right now, but also just to think about how would how would this type of a pilot how might it work in in Alaska? Uh, other thing I'll say is we we did. Um, same time that that or right actually before the application to Feeding America went in, uh, we had a joint a joint application between Menominee and Oneida for for the food distribution program on Indian reservations, the FDIPR, the 638 tribal self governance. Uh, so we had that go in. By the time that that by the time that that contract was finalized, we were almost done with a whole year of a pilot project with the Selder Food Box. So, you know, that's part of why I wanted to share it. Is really it was um, it it was kind of a first a first step of if we could put our own effort together and have the resources to do it. How how would we? I also say the only way to be able to make it work was all of the the huge number of partners that we had. Uh, so great, Dan. Thanks for sharing and glad your internet is working. Uh, we do have a few minutes for questions if anyone has any. You can type them in the chat or should be able to turn your video and mic on. And again, I'm really sorry for my internet issues there um, right in the <laughs> in the middle of that of, of that presentation. Oh, no worries. You know, so I guess my question is just, you know, how might this work in in Alaska? And you know, kind of going back to what are what are your local foods? I mean, I know fish. Um, I done some some background research, and you know, a few years ago, and just was really um, I was surprised at the extent of for our national fishery that it it's really almost entirely Alaska, and um, you know, so just for the immensity of of the of the fish that's there but i know that the kelp i would seen a comment you know that kelp is increasing the oysters and when you've got that that cold water that you've you know you know what, what really that uh that calendar i had what how does that calendar look for for alaska and, and i know it's going to probably look a little bit different from the coastal communities versus more of the inland 
Well, actually, Dan, if you want to stick around for uh, <laughs> Glenna and my presentation next, we're going to talk about just that. Um, you know, what are the important foods and, and what are people not only producing, but harvesting traditionally, which is far more important than uh, what they're selling probably. So it's, it's not so much industry driven, although you're right, the fish is, is definitely an important industry, but it's a lot of um, self-sufficient and subsistent harvesting too, so. Well, you know, and I'll say too of, I think for, um, you know, for my region, I think we do have a lot of similarities with Alaska that we have more, um, you know, more of uh, subsistence um, focus. And there, there's really, a, a, you know, I guess I would say that, that there's, a, there's kind of some taboos oftentimes against even selling foods. And, um, and, and I think a lot of that, you know, you look historically, so Menominee in 1865, Menominee sold 750,000 pounds of sugar. Uh, or 17 or 18, I'm sorry, 1866. In 1865, Michigan tribes had sold 450,000 pounds of sugar. But now today, for a lot of communities, I mean, it's kind of, there's tension of selling, of selling even, you know, of even maple syrup. And I, and I feel like a lot of that has just come to, for a lot of our traditional foods have become so scarce that, you know, it's really first to save it for the community. And I think that this this elder food box has it's it's helped to get more discussions going and thought going on um, you know it's this isn't all about the money. I don't know anyone who gets into really food to you know especially on the production side to get rich, but it's about providing scaling up that we have enough food, and it's also you know it. it it takes investment. It takes, it takes resources to be able to, um, you know, to, to do a lot of this work. So we're really trying to put, um, you know, to put a, I guess, to change the paradigm a bit of looking at how do we expand our tribal food economies? Um, yeah. So, you know, that's just a, just a, a little bit, you know, a little bit more, more background and, and where we've had more and more smaller uh, producers looking at, at either scaling up or, or people looking at, well, I, you know, I might be able to, I might be able to, to, to source, you know, provide eggs or chickens or meat or even vegetables for, for the effort. So we're seeing just in, you know, within a year that it has started to encourage more, um, more production oriented and focused on our, for our communities. And I, I do see a question, um, are uh, our elders or any of the elders receiving these food boxes also receiving food packages? Um, yes, the, some of some of them are. We don't have um, none of the participating tribes have had income restrictions or or income um, based decisions on on who gets the the elder food boxes though. Okay. Well, thank you. I I can. Um, one one yes, final yeah. question, I think, and then we'll move on to our presentation. Has there been a mention of someone who preferred the packages to what other portions they have gotten? Um, yeah, so you know with the with the portions, that was a big question. I mean, we don't want to be giving up too much food, but we want we want to give enough and and also um, you know we we're curious how much of that is being shared. And, and so that was some of the feedback we got is that a few people said it was a little bit much, especially some of them are, you know, have, you know, small refrigerators. In general, it seems like we're at a pretty good, a pretty good quantity and that, um, and that a, a pretty decent percentage of people were sharing it with, with other members of their family. Great. Well, thank you Great. so much, Dan. Um, all such a great program and super interesting. Um, so I've introduced myself already. I'm Heidi Rader, um, the moderator and now the presenter. And I'm going to present with Glenna Gannon, uh, who's 
a friend and colleague. We've worked together here at Cooperative Extension Service at the University of Alaska Fairbanks for quite a while now. Um, and we are going to be talking about a project to um, assess the needs and goals of tribes in Alaska around food and agriculture needs. And um, why we think this is so important is to kind of inform a lot of the policy around some of these USDA programs that Dan and Tommy and Leticia were talking about. Um, I'll let Glenna, if you want to introduce yourself quickly. Thanks. I was trying to find my mute button. I'm sharing screen. Uh, you think I'm new to Zoom. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks, Heidi, and I'm happy to be here. As Heidi mentioned, I am Glenna Gannon. I work with Heidi at the University of Alaska Fairbanks um, in the Institute of Agriculture, Natural Resources, and Extension. I've also um, yeah, been uh, helping Heidi out with the Federally Recognized Tribes Extension Program for about 10 years now. Um, and so a lot of this work that we're presenting today is sort of built on those experiences and a current uh, project that we have funded now um, by the Native American Agriculture mm -hmm. Fund, which Heidi will tell us a little bit more about. Oh, but first, Heidi, do you want to? Sure. Yeah, just wanted to acknowledge that we're here, um, acknowledge the Alaska Nations where the traditional lands of our campus is here on the Troth Yetta campus in Fairbanks, uh, where we live and work. So, yes, we are grateful to live, work, and have fulfilling lives on this land that was stewarded by the Dana people of the Lower Tana River for millennia before us. All right. Oh, and here's some more context. I know this is one of your your favorite. Uh, Graphics, Heidi, do you want to share more about this? Yeah, yeah, I uh, love this graphic. Um, this was put together by Jared Williams. And, um, you know, this is the Food Policy Council. And a lot of times we think about eating food, which is the obvious thing you do with food. And, um, but I think it's important to just acknowledge how much culture is involved in the harvest and the securing and the learning of. Um, and the community aspect of securing that food and particularly with traditional harvest methods. And, and so I just love this graphic that, that demonstrates that so well, that eating is just the cherry on top of what we do with food. Um, and I think that's what we're, we're really trying to understand with this project is you know, what, it, what, is, what are all these other aspects of gathering food and what do people really want to do? Because um, with the, the U.S. Department of Agriculture and as someone who um, is supported by USDA through grants, we often are, we often come at food with, with the idea that cultivating and farming and ranching is, is the ideal and, but sometimes the farming and the ranching can actually, um, you know, as we talked about this morning, can kind of take away some of these other opportunities for securing food. So we're trying to really inform policy around, you know, why it's so important to look at the whole picture and not necessarily give preference to cultivating over traditional forms of getting food. So. Um, and backing up a little bit, I'm with Cooperative Extension Service and serve the interior Alaska tribes. And Glenna has worked with me on, on that program for quite a while. And so another aspect of this prog project is to get an idea of what other tribes in Alaska might be interested in the tribes extension program. And so I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but um, basically, if anyone's familiar with 4-H or the Master Gardener program, um, those are all cooperative extension programs. But with the Tribes Extension program, it can also support um, traditional, you know, traditional cultural language um, education and 
and just advocacy as well. So it's not limited to just farming, which is also a, a great aspect of that program because many of the USDA programs do require that you are a farmer or a rancher. And so for Alaska, we're always kind of, always trying to help tribes fit into um, access those programs while not being necessarily a traditional farmer or rancher. So, and Glenna, maybe you wanna talk a little bit about the research too and, and how we're informing, informing that too. Yeah, so so Heidi kind of outlined it well. Um, this, you know, a lot the impetus for this work is to help us, us as the researchers, um, do our job. Which, uh, or and we're not necessarily approaching this as just researchers, but as um, people involved with the FERTEP program, help us um, achieve the objective of of our roles in order to um, really. Uh, support the fostering of healthy food systems um, and uh, tribal sovereignty in Alaska. And so Heidi will talk more about um, the FERTEP program and how this work ties into that a little bit later on. But as Heidi mentioned, a lot of this um, you know, work is intended to address uh, the missing sort of piece of USDA funding um, in terms of the Alaska food system. So she talked about how a lot of these funding opportunities are often geared towards farmers or ranchers, and that's not exactly a culturally appropriate fit here in Alaska, um, or even geographically. And then, um, you know, traditional ways of harvesting food are not equally supported or valued by USDA. And so that was a large piece of proposing this work um, to the Native American Agriculture Fund was to um, ideally conduct this needs assessment that would help us uh, convey to um, funding agencies as well as policymakers. So this is the Alaska Food Policy Council and Heidi and I are both on the governing board. So relaying that information back to these organizations to ideally get better representation um, of Alaska, specifically Alaska Native needs um, into, these, into these programs. So we're doing that specifically by, you know, working with um, tribal organizations to, to get at that, which I'll talk more about in a second. But here's an example of, of what we're talking about, right? So the definition of agriculture and farming in um, the United States context by the USDA is fairly limited in scope. Um, and I think we're probably all fairly familiar with the sort of um, sort of Western contextualized uh, idea of farming and agriculture and how that doesn't always jive um, with indigenous food production uh, modalities. I'm using production kind of loosely here because that word doesn't always match up either. Um, and I've been sharing this example a lot recently, so forgive me if you've already seen it, um, but this is one of the kinds of things that, um, you know, Heidi and I and our, the groups that we're working with um, like the idea of is that some of this work could potentially um, work to uh, inform the definition of agriculture um, for Alaska in particular, like it has in the Yukon Northwest Territories, which does include things like herding wild animals, such as caribou, um, harvesting indigenous plants and berries in Alaska. Ideally, this would include, um, you know, marine harvest of, uh, or harvest of marine plants, animals, and fish. And so what that does ideally is it represents the really unique and varied mosaic of wild um, produced, raised, um, and stewarded foods in Alaska. And so we've talked about some of these things already and people have been touching on them, but you know, that's everything from seal oil uh, to wild plants, to um, kelp farming, to our, our commercial fisheries and subsistence fisheries and buffalo. And that's just to name a few. Um, so getting things like this recognized into, um, you know, funding agencies to our states, uh, definitions of what it is to be a producer, specifically a native producer, um, would be a huge step forward in terms of uh, addressing sort of this missing piece of the puzzle, if you were. And so now I'll just take a few minutes to talk about the nitty gritty of the needs assessment that we've been conducting 
um, we're, we're mid process. And so this is sort of serves as a um, status update and also what we've learned so far. Um, okay, so how, how is the needs assessment done? And I'll try to keep this um, as not boring as possible. Uh, so the first step is we worked um, for about a year to uh, form some regional steering committees. And um, I have an example here of that represents uh, sort of the, the representation in our Southeast steering committee. I didn't do um, a, a node or a bubble like this for each region. Um, but we do have, we have worked with um, several, so it's a statewide project, um, I'll mention that, and we've worked with Southeast, we've worked with the Aleutian Pribilof Islands region, um, we've worked with some folks up in the northwest of Alaska, and then through Heidi and I's association with the Tano Chiefs Conference, um, and the interior, that sort of um, serves as our um, interior node, if you will. And so, um, the, you know, in working with these steering committees, what they have done is we've really, we've really worked together as a group to first hold regular meetings to keep each other informed of what we're working on. Um, the steering committees help us design the surveys and they've reviewed the questions and given us some feedback on that to make sure that we're asking, you know, regionally and culturally specific questions, meaningful questions. Um, and then also, uh, um, you know, addressing any uh, programmatic needs or questions that our partners in the region might have. Um, and so from there, you know, we've designed these surveys um, and we have launched them in the four regions that I mentioned. And so the asterisks that you see there on the first two bulleted items are sort of the things that we've done. And then um, the other two, so we'll be doing uh, key informant interviews with just which just means following up with some of the folks who completed the surveys who we'd like to learn more from um, and then uh, sharing out and report writing. So the sharing out will be again back to our steering committee partners. Um, it will be to the Alaska Food Policy Council and ideally those reports once finalized um, with the input of our regional steering committees uh, will be shared with policymakers. And I will just mention that um, our surveys um, and key informant interviews do have um, some compensation associated with them. So we do value people's time and are making sure to account for that. Um, so like I said, this is just a status update and um, this is sort of a continuation of that. Um, one thing that uh, we will be sharing the links for, and unfortunately I realized while I shared my screen that I couldn't also share um, some of the survey links in the chat because I can't get to my notes. So. Stay tuned, I'll be dropping a whole bunch of links at the end of this survey um, so that you can access, if you're joining from any of the regions that I mentioned, you can access the survey and complete that if you'd like to be involved. Um, and Heidi and I will also provide our email addresses because if you're interested in just getting more information or knowing how you could get involved, we would love to talk to you about that. Um, we're still very much in the process of gathering information um, that will go in ultimately into our, our um, summaries of, of what we found for, for each region. Um, and then Heidi will talk more about the grant proposal development a little bit later in the presentation, so I won't spend time there now. Um, and then interviews are actually gonna start next week uh, after this conference. So um, here's the kind of information. This is just a preview. None of this is published data. And so it's not something that will be um, in a report or that we uh, will be sharing in a more official capacity just yet but I wanted to give you a sense of the kind of information that we are generating in this uh, needs assessment. Um, so this is just from Southeast Alaska, um, although there are some parallels with other regions that we've been working with. Um, oh, and I'll just back up and quickly say that um, we are working on creating our own surveys, but in uh, instances like uh, the Ocean Pribilofs Islands Association was actually launching our own food security um, assessment around the same time we uh, got funding and this project got rolling. And so in that partnership, we agreed to uh, avoid some survey fatigue and do some data sharing with them. So we don't necessarily have a distinct survey for each region, depending on what was already going on there. Okay, so quickly, um, this is probably a lot to digest really quickly. Um, and I acknowledge that. And if anyone has questions or would like to go back to this, I'm happy to share. Um, but the point of these couple of slides, I just want to point out that, um, you know, the things that are 
not necessarily, oops, um, not necessarily relating to uh, individuals' lifestyles or um, cultural values up here in Alaska. Really, are um, you know farming, ranching, agricultural. So these are terms that we gave people the opportunity to weigh in on how they how they felt about it, whether it applies to their life and their cultural values, whether it doesn't, whether it's something people want to do more of or something they want to do less of, and. I like to think that the the survey software got the colors back set back backwards. You know, red red means no and green means go got swapped. So um, it's it's a rainbow to decipher. But the point is where these arrows are. That purple bar in the pie graph indicates how many people really didn't um, you know resonate with the terms farming or ranching. However. Um, many of us probably could have guessed that um, terms and activities like traditional native foods, fishing, hunting, wild harvesting, gardening, food sharing, especially, um, you know, these, these are the types of activities around food that Alaska natives specifically, and people who are in these regions are, um, you know, very active in that they feel, um, you know, deeply spiritually connected to, but also is, the main, um, I guess, glue of their food system in, in a lot of these communities. And I'll back up a little bit and just say, to give you a sense of the demographics. So about 30 people have completed this particular survey for the region. And of that, about 65% are Alaska native. Um, so there are some of those folks from the regional um, steering committees who are, are serving native communities or organizations um, who have also taken this survey. So it's not exclusively Alaska native, but um, it's predominantly. All right, so that just kind of, you know, it, I think it's reiterating what we all know, but the point of something like a needs assessment is to come up with some data that we can point to when we're making the case to um, places like funding agencies and, and our policymakers, right? So here's just a few more of the types of questions that we've asked and the responses that we've got, and I'm going to go through this fairly quickly in um, the interest of time, but uh, if you just want to read these, I'll, I'll read a couple choice ones, but um, you know, and we can go back if anyone's interested, but, you know, when we ask people what they're most satisfied about in their communities, um, people often talk about the wild harvested foods, um, that are available to them and having a connection with land and food and community through that connection. So community that is strengthened and maintained by frequent sharing and harvest of families between families, neighbors, and others and abundant wild foods. Um, and then people also were talking about the presence of small farms and food production models. So, um, you know, I didn't talk about it in the, in the um, pie charts, but gardening, oops, gardening was another one of those activities that people did identify with um, for, their, for their lifestyle activities. So farming and ranching, not so much, agriculture, not so much, but gardening, yes. So we know that um, plant stewardship, plant cultivation, Plant relate, being in relationship with plants is something that people have been doing for millennia in Alaska. So that shouldn't be surprising, but again, here's, here's some explicit examples. Um, so in asking people what they're least satisfied about, um, people often talked about the lack of fresh produce, um, the outrageous price of groceries, um, and the fact that often um, getting out to access wild foods was um, either cost prohibitive or time prohibitive if they had full-time jobs. Um, and then there's also um, many instances where people talked about um, human capital. So people having the knowledge to do certain things within their community, which is what this slide gets at. So when asking folks what they felt was most needed to help their community move towards the vision of food security, um, uh, education came up a lot. So, um, you know, have technical skills, education, um, both for uh, youth audiences as well as the general community, um, so that people both knew how to um, convey their traditional practices to, you know, to the community at all ages, but also um, to grow food. If that is a adaptive strategy um, in face of, you know, decreasing wild abundance and uh, climate change, then um, you know, people who are interested in growing food are um, recognizing that there is a greater need for um, education and programs that provide some of those, again, technical skills to um, move into that new or a different food production space. 
And so with that, just again, hi, <coughs> excuse me, highlighting the wild abundance um, that Alaska has, um, we think of producer as an agricultural term potentially, but I think here in Alaska, sorry, I <coughs> just got something stuck in my throat, but here in Alaska, um, that that means so much more. And so that that is, you know, the nugget that we're trying to get at. And so I'm <coughs> gonna excuse myself and hand the mic. Thanks, Glenna. Um, yeah, that, that I, I think you covered the, the survey project really great. And thank you all. I've been fielding a bunch of questions here over in the chat, um, a lot of which have to do with the tribe's extension program and also the processes which we're using to um, you know, go about this project. So uh, one of the questions had to do with you know, which regions we're working with and um, also, are we, you know, are we following appropriate um, rules and and kind of guidelines for doing this type of work? So, uh, Glenn, if you have anything to add in the chat, I will move over to the presentation and focus on uh, kind of explaining a little bit more what the tribe's extension program is. So, um, so if you wanted to go, yeah. Perfect. So what is the Tribes Extension Program? So one of the really wonderful things about this program is that it is a close partnership with a tribe, or in the case of Alaska, um, a group of tribes. So I have been working in this position funded partially by the federally recognized Tribes Extension Grant with Tanana Chiefs Conference, which is a tribal consortium here in interior Alaska of 37 tribes um, for 15 years now. And I think it's a, a great program because it is flexible and I'm always trying to help the tribes in the region access some of these other USDA programs, whether it's NRCS or um, Farm Service Agency. And a lot of these programs are geared specifically towards farmers. And so uh, when, you know, part, part of what I, have been able to do, I think, is help USDA programs or you know program leaders understand better the needs of tribes in Alaska, and then also help tribes in Alaska see how even if they don't consider themselves a farmer or a rancher or want to be a farmer or rancher, maybe they can um, access those programs even if they they don't quite see themselves as a farmer, but they're a food producer, they want to grow food. Um, and so one of those programs that we kind of were able to access was the Beginning Farmer and Rancher Development Program. And um, maybe even, I've, I think I've seen a few people who were past students of that program called the Alaska Grower School. And, and so we kind of, you know, we, we said, Producing food is important to villages. We don't have a lot of farmers, less than 50 Alaska Native farmers in the state, but there's all these folks who do want to learn how to grow more food and either for themselves or their community. So again, that's a distinction between a farm is a farm is where people usually sell the food, not just grow the food for themselves and their community. Um, but of course, we all know that's still just as important. So if you can go to the next, next slide, Glenna. Um, and, and so the partnership is also with this particular program, it, is, um, it has to go through the university and it has to have, have a partnership with a tribe or group of tribes. And, and so after being in this position for about 15 years, um, and I, I just, you know, I thought it was important to let other tribes in Alaska know it's important. We have had a program in Bristol Bay for um, probably close to 10 years now as well, and that focuses primarily on youth, which is also a focus of the program. And we just recently submitted a, a grant with the Aleutian Pribilof Island region as well um, to, to have a, a dedicated extension agent there as well. And, Another thing too, if you are you know, a tribal member in another area, not in Bristol Bay or the APIA region or interior, um, 
with Zoom and with uh, all the virtual work we're doing, um, I, I've expanded my focus to serve other tribes in Alaska as well. And so not just um, in interior Alaska too. So we, you know, and, and of course, Lena is working with me on this program as well. And just with all of the virtual options, we're able to expand and serve more tribes um, in that way. So, um, so these are some of the, the focuses of the FURTEP program. Um, actually, could you go back? Oh, thanks. And so as you can see, it's not just farming and ranching, which is also unique from a USDA funded program. It could be an adaptation to climate change, um, language preservation, cultural preservation. Um, we've even done skiing with, with youth. Uh, we do food preservation, traditional, you know, of course, traditional foods like salmon, moose meat, um, high bush cranberries. And, and so it's, it's very much driven by what tribes request, what their, you know, the education that they're um, interested in. So we always wait for an invitation and a workshop request. And, and so tribes are very much driving, driving this program. Um, and let's see. So I, Glenna, could you, I see we only have a few more minutes. So let's go to the next slide. They're kind of jumping around. I'm not sure what's going on there, but <laughs> there we go. Um, this is another program that's available, the Master Gardener Online program statewide, um, and it's, it's all virtual. And lots of YouTube videos out there as well. Um, of course, those are open to anyone. Um, and if we could just go to the Get Involved slide now. If you are interested in helping get the word out about the survey that we, that Glenna talked about, um, that would be that would be super helpful. Um, we are going to do phone interviews as part of the survey as well, and and we do have compensation for um, for those too. So um, so if anyone is willing to spread the word, um, please get in touch. Another great way to uh, stay involved with this project is by joining the Indigenous Foods Working Group. Um, and of course, this is one of many projects that that group is working on. It's really just an opportunity to connect with other people working um, to promote Indigenous food sovereignty and Indigenous foods in Alaska um, as part of the Alaska Food Policy Council. And Go to the last slide. Got our contact information up there. Um, and so you can send either one of us an email. This is the website for the Tribes Extension Program as well. It's on the Cooperative Extension Service site. And I think we, we have about three minutes for any final questions before we go to lunch. I'll just say I'm really sorry about the slides jumping around. I'm trying to respond to chat, but like every button I use is advancing or doing something with the slides. So I'm sorry for, <laughs> for a bad piloting oh, thanks, here. Um, and for for um, some of you, I'm trying to respond in the chat um, to, to certain questions. Um, and maybe I'll just speak up quickly rather than try and actually type them in. And to Carl, um, I was just trying to say that's an excellent and totally fair question regarding data usage. Um, so to your point, that's exactly why we set out at the beginning of this project to work on developing relationships with um, these regional steering committees. And so those are, you know, purposefully made up of um, tribal organizations like Clinkett and Haida Council, like um, Aleutian Pribilof Islands Association, so that they're really helping guide this um, work and, and the needs assessment because they know their region much better than we do and we wouldn't assume to. Um, and then those are also our partners for data sharing. So the information that we gain from this will be shared, um, you know, in reciprocity with them. It will also be shared, as Heidi had just mentioned, with the um, 
Indigenous Foods Working Group with the Alaska Food Policy Council, which is made up of a lot of Indigenous food leaders in our community. I think a few of you are on here. I've seen Tia and Tikan um, and, uh, and, you know, Rinalda Angusson and um, quite a few folks. Um, uh, we have worked together um, sort of from the outset of this project to, um, yeah, try and identify the best ways to both gather this information, but then share it back in a respectful way. Um, so I hope that answers your question. And if not, I'm happy to answer more. Um, I think I'm going to stop the share and try and drop in some links to the chat that I wasn't able to while we were talking. And again, I'm really sorry for the, oops, for the jumping around. Um, that was 100% my bad. <laughs> Uh, so um, first, let's see. Yeah, Heidi's dropping in some. So, um, and I, I just wanted to say this uh, presentation will be recorded um, and is being recorded. So I would say, um, feel free to send us an email if you would like a link to the slides and we'll just double check. We're ready to share some of those. Um, survey results out. I guess if it's being recorded, it's already being shared. Um, thanks for all of your great questions. I, um, Lenette is sharing survey links over in the chat to those regional surveys. And hopefully you guys captured our emails. I'll just put those in the chat again too. And I'll just mention, um, you know, if you are interested in taking the survey, um, there's a few links in there and I tried to separate them out and just make sure if you're going to take one, um, you, you try to identify your region. So if you're anywhere in Southeast Alaska um, and if you're not sure where, where you should maybe fit in, or if we don't have a survey for your region, like we are completely aware that um, while this is a statewide program, we don't have like the, um, North Slope represented in these surveys. And that's not for um, any uh, reason to exclude them. Um, that's, you know, we have a limited time period and um, Heidi was working on getting some of those uh, FERTEP grants written. And so we were um, at this time building on the momentum um, of the partnerships we had rather than spreading ourselves too thin in trying to develop, you know, momentum where where we didn't have it yet, it doesn't mean that those regions um, are purposefully excluded. And if you are from, you know, South Central or um, you know the Northwest Slope and would like to be, you know, involved in this project or um, form help us form a steering committee, we would love to hear from you. So yeah, Heidi shared our emails. Um, please please get in touch if you have any follow up questions. I know we went over a lot. Um, and then I did see one question about, and Heidi, I think you covered this, but I'll just reiterate, if you're interested in those FERTEP uh, workshops um, that Heidi and I offer, I just dropped the link under Tribes Extension Program at Tanana Chiefs Conference. Um, so that's the best place to find contact information as well as information about the types of um, workshops that are offered and uh, where you can make a request for one. Great, and there was another question too. So before we, you know, kind of, if we don't have a survey for the region where you are, um, but you think this is important work, we'd love to work with you and other tribal um, stakeholders in your region before we release that survey too. Um, so thanks Irene for your question. Um, ooh, we are two minutes over. Um, we have a short lunch break, so I'm going to go back to my moderator hat and let you know that we have a half an hour lunch break. So um, thank you all for joining and your excellent questions. Please get in touch. Um, and if you have further questions and would like to work with us. So thanks again.